book of Luke. Today we'll be looking at chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. And Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until it is found? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of God for the people of God. If we look here, we find that Luke has dedicated this entire chapter and focuses on Jesus' teaching the Pharisees and the teachers of the law about seeking out the lost. We have a parable of the lost sheep, a parable about a lost coin. And we also have a parable that we didn't read today about the prodigal son. All three stories speak about seeking out what is lost and celebrating when the lost item is then restored. I found that stories are some of the most powerful teaching tools. We as human beings had this natural desire to be entertained. Think of all the countless hours we spend watching TV, whether it's sports or documentaries or a series of, uh, on TV, or how about reading of the books or newspapers or listening to the radio. All the many different ways that we get our information or our entertainment from. One thing common among humans is that we all love stories and good teachers realize that. Well, we know that Jesus was the master teacher and he used parables to teach. He used them because they were entertaining and also because they would stretch the minds of his listeners. Stories are an invaluable tool to teachers. If we look throughout the Gospels, we find several of Jesus' stories repeated, which tells me they are important enough to hear again and again. This past week, I had the pleasure of visiting with my family from Texas. We sat around the dinner table one night, and one thing that we did was that we shared stories about our family. Some of these stories we've repeated over and over again as how we learn our history and how we pass it along to the younger generation. So if we as family groups repeat stories and Jesus retells his parables, I think it's important for us to hear some stories more than once. At different times in our lives, we take away something different from the stories that we hear. So today, I want to offer to you a story that I shared shortly after I came here, way back in 2014. I do this because I think it's important for us to hear this message again. At some point in time, we've all lost our way. We have taken a wrong turn or didn't follow directions and we have become lost. 
So this morning, I want you to listen once again to a story by Bradley Hall. As you hear this tale today, I want you to see where you fit into this story. There was great distress among the sheep. Little Wally, the son of the prominent flock members, Dru Drusella and Arthur, was missing. The panic had begun in early afternoon when he didn't return to the plane. Soon, though, the shepherd found out that Wally was gone. And about nightfall, he set out to search for him. Everybody knew and liked little Wally. And the whole night, while the shepherd searched, nobody slept a wink. Well, nobody that is except for Roger. Even by sheep standards, Roger was a black sheep. Among other things, Roger was very unpleasant. He had this grating baa. When it came time to move from one pasture to another, Roger always stayed at the very back of the flock. And he complained. And when it came time to be sheared, Roger would kick and thrash about so it took twice as long to shear him as any other sheep. So it wasn't surprising that while the rest of the flock stayed up saying kind words to Drusilla and Arthur, giving them encouragement, Roger slept like a log. He wasn't with the others when little Wally was safely returned. He wasn't included in the joy and the excitement that the others shared. All well, some weeks later, as everybody was sleeping, a wolf crept into the fold. He noticed that while all the other sheep were sort of clumped together, one of them, that you can guess who it was, Roger, he was off by himself. While the wolf grabbed him and took him off by the scruff of his neck and began to drag him away. He was planning on eating Roger. But Roger woke up and he began bleeding in such a loud, harsh voice that it hurt the wolf's sensitive ears. And so he thrashed around so hardly that the wolf eventually decided it's really not worth the effort. So he dropped him and left him out there. Well, the only trouble was Roger was now out in the middle of nowhere he had no clue of where he was. He began to appreciate now that while the other sheep were at best a necessary evil, the shepherd had been good and a valuable friend. The shepherd had shown him to fresh new pastures. He had led him to cool streams of water. And he had, until the present moment anyway, had kept him safe. But now, he was out in this rocky, barren plain with no idea how to get food for himself or water and no hope of finding the rest of the flock. He tried to go to sleep, but he kept dreaming about wolves and jackals and hyenas and about starving to death. Oh, well, he lived alone. It was only figured that he would die alone. He dozed on and off, and about the time the sun was coming up, he heard some heavy, deliberate footsteps. Probably a bear, he thought. At least it's going to be quick. So he closed his eyes, and he waited to be torn limb from limb. Meanwhile, back at the fold, things were hopping. A few of the sheep who were light sleepers had just in time woken up to see that the shepherd was leaving and they figured something was up the sheep ran the facts through their little sheep brains and they came up with only one conclusion somebody was missing like a brush fire the news flashed through the herd somebody's missing all the parents checked their children all the husbands checked their wives. All the wives checked their husbands. Everybody checked on the elderly relatives. Hmm. All are present and accounted for. That's kind of odd. Why would the shepherd leave us if one was not missing? They ran through their little sheep brains again, and he came up with the idea that 
He has abandoned us. The shepherd has abandoned us. Within minutes, everybody heard of their abandonment, and the fold was in a blind panic. The frenzy carried on until well after sunup, when Osgood, one of the particularly sharp-eyed sheep, saw the shepherd coming over a distant hill. The sheep rejoiced. They jumped and they frolicked and they bleated with joy even greater than they felt when little Wally was returned. But their celebration didn't last very long. There, on the shepherd's shoulders, was Roger. They had done their nose count, but Roger had alienated all the rest of the flock so badly that nobody even thought to look for him. The sheep were dumbstruck. What's the big idea? The shepherd had left all of us good, cooperative, well-meaning sheep to go rescue an obnoxious, unpleasant, antisocial one. Finally, Arthur was appointed to take the flock's complaint to the shepherd. They had it all written out. <clears throat> Whereas, some days ago, the sheep were left alone to fend for themselves. And whereas we were given no indication that the shepherd intended to return, and whereas the uncertainty over the shepherd's return caused serious distress amongst us, and whereas all this distress has caused over a sheep that really nobody really even hardly really liked very much in the first place, really even hard, they had a hard time writing this part. <laughs> Therefore, be it resolved that we the sheep do strongly protest our abandonment on the night in question, that we demand a full explanation of the reason for said abandonment, and that we demand an apology for such thoughtless and irresponsible action on the part of the shepherd. We demand justice. Sign the flock. When the shepherd received the message, he called a meeting of the sheep and responded to each of the items in turn. Yes? It's true, I left the flock all alone for a few nights a few nights ago, and you were left to fend for yourselves. But nobody seemed to mind when I left you alone to go and find Wally. Yeah, that's different, answered Chester the sheep, but he was shushed down. As to the part about not knowing whether you've been abandoned, well, frankly, I'm a little surprised at all of you. Have I ever abandoned you before? Haven't I always protected you from the wolves and taken you to fresh pastures and clear streams? I never abandoned you before. Why would I start now? Yeah, but this is different, insisted Mildred the sheep. But she too was shushed down. And finally, as to this part about it being unfair, what was unfair about it? Wouldn't I have done the same for any one of you? Well, said Herman the sheep, going out and saving the rest of us, well, that's one thing, but you put all the rest of us in jeopardy for him. And he motioned to Roger, who, true in sheep form, was fast asleep, snoring loudly far away from the others. That is what really bothers us, said Arnold the sheep. Why didn't you just let him take his chance out there? He didn't deserve to be saved. It's not fair. And for once, well, he probably didn't know it, one of the sheep had told the truth. Half of it, anyways. Roger did not deserve to get saved. It was not fair. Of course, the other half of the truth is, <coughs> None of the other sheep deserve to get saved either. They all deserve to be left to take their chances, but they didn't have to. The shepherd looked after them and rescued them when they needed it. This would probably be a much more satisfying story if I told you that Roger's experience changed his life profoundly. That from that day forward, he went on to become a model sheep, cooperative, appreciative, and obedient. But he didn't. 
he got a little bit better for a while, and then he kind of tapered off. The only real difference anyone could tell was that he didn't complain quite as much while moving from pasture to pasture, and he didn't thrash around quite as much when he got sheared. Roger remained to the end of his days a sheep wholly undeserving of the shepherd's rescue. Salvation comes to the undeserving. And that is good news because we are all undeserving. We know that God through Christ does not do what we think is fair. God does not do what we think is just. God does what is pleasing to God, and that is better than fair. That is called grace. The foremost of sinners receives salvation so that Jesus Christ can display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So, if you are ever tempted to be resentful of the salvation received by those who seem undeserving, don't worry. There's plenty of salvation for everybody. The good sheep, the bad sheep, and all of us in between. Amen. Amen.